Hello everyone and welcome to Forgotten Fables Wolves of the West Wind. So, about a month or so ago I was contacted by Vicarious P PR and they wanted me to check out this game. I have no idea about it. I didn't even notice it at all on Steam. I haven't really been on Steam a whole lot recently, but this does look very interesting. It does have a, I believe it is a, a adventure RPG kind of feel to it. So. And it does have that witcheress Vikings kind of feel. And I love Vikings and I love The Witcher. So I've played all three games. I've watched just about all the Vikings. So anything kind of centered around that type of culture, that type of feel, then I really do like the look of it. So just to give you a little background on this story, it says on Steam, in the wake of rising tensions and dark omens manifesting across Adventuria, a powerful force long forgotten to the world is reawakening. On your way to the quiet Thorwillian town of Islesfell, you are swept up into a quest to destroy the evil before it can once again rain terror down on the north, binding you by trial and fate to the children of Islesfell's hetman, a mysterious elf, and the Ataljasko of the infamous Thorwillian raider Ivor Erikson, the wolves of the West Wind. Your choices will lead you down the path to redemption or condemnation, so tread carefully. Also, I apologize in advance because I'm pretty sure I'm butchering these names and so on and so forth. So if I said something wrong, by all means, let me know about it. So, and this was produced by, owned by Gravity and Ulysses Digital. So shout out to them. And let's go ahead and take a look at this and see what we have. Oh, and this is another thing. So you have two characters you can play as. And I think it goes back and forth between the two. So I don't know if this is a permanent choice or not. So let's see what do we have here. Nadim or Nedeme. You have 18 health, 30 astral points. You are Nedeme Saba Deshjadir, a mage from the lands of the Ptolemies, struggling to complete her training. You came north to seek help from the Runa Josko, a community of Thorwillian magic users. Having been turned away, you are now returning south with no plan of what to do next. Your abilities are Blinding Flash. Blinding Flash is a spell that confuses the target's sense of sight so that they have trouble perceiving their surroundings. Or Orkin Foxus? Foxes? Orkin Foxus is an elemental spell that causes a jet of air to damage its target and blow it backwards. The spell might be used in combat to force enemies away, but also to affect the environment around Nedeme. Okay. Or I can play as Ulrich. You are Ulrich Duron Durando? Duronald? You're Ulrich Duronald, a weathered mercenary from Andergast who has wasted his life away fighting other people's battles. You came north to Thorwall protecting a Nostrian traitor who was on his way to important talks with the hetman of Islesfell, Ulfgar Furin Jason. And my abilities are Battle Sense. Battle Sense is an ability that allows Auric to pick up on things others might miss, allowing him to spot weaknesses in combat opponents and find hidden advantages in many situations. And I have Forceful Blow. This ability allows Auric to strike with an overwhelmingly strong blow to knock opponents back take them by surprise and to get through a variety of obstacles that might stand in his way. So I'm going to play as Auric. Um, I'm usually not a big magic user. You know, that's a lie. I play Dragon Age and I play <laughs> mage characters a lot, especially in the later Dragon Ages and so on and so forth. But this time around, I'm going to play as the, I guess you could say the more attack focused character. Mages tend to die quick and stuff, depending on what you're playing as. And then there's kind of the, you have to learn how to play as a mage. Whereas usually when you play as warriors, you can just kind of jump into it and just see what you got. So, Auric, let us continue. Act one, chapter, and, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Get down. You hear the twang of a bowstring and enough time to throw the traitor you're, you're escorting into cover. He leaves behind a bush in a blind panic as you skitter around a nearby tree to keep watch. This road was supposed to be safe. I had it guaranteed. Uh, we need to ditch the cart. We'd escape much quicker if, if we weren't dragging the cart behind us. Oh no, we've come this far. I'm not throwing it all away now. You can torture yourself around to look behind the tree without giving the archers a target to hit. 
It's too dark to see them, or their numbers clearly. You can hear them though, getting closer quickly. Alice fell as close. We should make a run for it. You know he's not wrong, but you also know that unless you do something now, that alone will not be enough. Mmm. Should I ditch the cart or fend the bandits off? Hmm. Well, I guess we could go ahead and get a look at this combat real quick. Uh, let's fend the bandits off. As another arrow sails past, you growl and shake your head as you tighten your grip on your sword. You need to go as quickly as you can. I'll fend them off. But go now. You pick him up by his collar and throw him back towards the road where he scrambles to stay upright. He casts one last desperate look towards you and the cart you now protect before he bolts away awkwardly. Another arrow flies past your face to pierce the cart's woodwork as you stand ready to protect it. Out of the shadows, you start to see the nearest of the bandits race towards you. One has followed you directly and relentlessly down the path. The next appears from the verge, whirling an axe around as she goes. One after another, they appear out of the darkness, and you know you'll be overrun in moments. Um, hmm. Get the cart moving, abandon the cart, or forceful blow. Hmm, I have a little bit of attack there, so yeah. This ability allows Auric to strike with an overwhelming strength, strong blow to knock the opponents back. Take them by surprise and to get through a variety of obstacles that might stand in his way. So that's what we saw earlier. Uh, just off the bat, this is kind of giving me a, um, what was that game name? Uh, Darkest Dungeon, I think it was. It kind of gives me that feel with the combat. So yeah, uh, forceful blow. Thinking quickly, you focus all of your power into a kick at the cart's rear wheel that makes the wood creak and crack. You wait for the bandits to close in before kicking out again so that the cart's axles buckles and gives way. One of the bandits shrieks in surprise as he hits square in the head with a barrel. The second slows as another rolls towards her. The resulting confusion gives you enough of a chance to dodge away and escape. And so, you run. You can already see jostled, jostled ahead, flailing about as he struggles to keep up any kind of pace. So focused are you on your escape that you don't even notice the town now clearly visible ahead. It's only when the first arrow sails past you in the other direction that you really focus on the palisade. People are now racing out of the town towards you, all well armed and well armored. Um, I'm going to join the fight. I mean, that's what I do. As the road between the palisade and the bandits becomes a hail of arrows, you see Jostle look back towards you. Go, go. He has the good sense to listen to you and disappears through the throng of the Thorwillian warriors that run to meet you. You feel a swell of confidence as cries ring out across the plains. These are the numbers you need for a fair fight. The real danger has passed. Against all the odds, you've actually made it to safety. It is a long fight and those who were chasing you are quickly routed by the town's defenders. They ask you many questions about the chase as they invite you into the town proper. And then you can finally rest a while, laying down your burdens until morning comes. All right, so I got my first achievement, Danger on the Road. It's a cold but bright sun that rises over the thatched roofs of Alicefell to greet you the next day. Even after years of training and experience, you still feel the aches and pains of your trials and tribulations. A gentle breeze tugs at your clothes, and the smell of salt on the air helps to keep you sharp. And the town wakes up around you as though nothing had ever happened. People open up their shops and services for the day. Seagirls call overhead. Over the din, you hear the blowing of bellows and the pounding of a hammer against steel as a blacksmith gets to work. Outlander. <laughs> I started watching that show, didn't finish it. No sooner have you stopped at a market stand of freshly baked loaves and buns do you hear her call. You immediately recognize her as one of the warriors who came to your rescue at the Palisade. Amongst the rest of the townsfolk, she stands out in a dress much richer and brighter in color. Estrit Ufsgar, uh, Ufsgar's daughter. We met briefly last night. That's a thing. I do remember that a lot in Vikings where like the sons of Ragnar, you had Ivar Ragnarsson, 
and so on and so forth. It took me a while to get that. Plus, I play a lot of Crusader Kings, so that's going to be a mouthful. But Estrid Ufsgar's daughter. We met briefly last night. Um, good morning. Good morning. I'm glad to meet you properly this time. Indeed, let me be the first to give you a proper welcome to Islesville. I can only apologize for the chaos of your arrival. It was hardly your fault. What can I do for you? Her brow furrows as she grimaces as, at you and becomes more serious. I'm afraid it's about the attack. My father wishes to speak to you about it. Come, you eat with us this morning. It's the least we can do. Much to the complaining of your empty stomach, you're torn away from breakfast to follow Estrid. She leads you further inland, jostling through the crowds as the town wakes around you. I'll be honest with you, Outlander. This attack was quite troubling. We need to make sure nothing like that ever happens again if we can. We have a reputation to uphold. Hmm. What about patrols? I noticed there weren't any patrols on the roads. She chuckles and gives you a wry smile as she massages the muscles in her hands. It's been a long time since any thought it necessary to protect our lands with patrols. My father has worked hard to make Alice Fell safe. Those who break our laws are met either with justice or retribution. One way or the other, it is quick, so most should know better than to ambush travelers here. That's what makes this attack so troubling. We must act quickly to find those responsible. Estrid falls darkly quiet after that. It makes you slightly more uneasy as you continue up the gentle slope toward the Hetman's Hall. The fight had been over almost as soon as it had started. Many of your attackers had fled at the first sight of defending warriors, but those who had helped you had been quick to usher your away, you away to a longhouse to rest and recover. They had seemed a little on edge, but you thought that was simply down to the surprise of the attack. Now it seems that something larger was at work, and that the hetman wants to speak to you about it is concerning. The noise of the town only swells as its bustling streets awaken. But as you climb upwards, everything starts to feel just a little less cramped as the space between buildings grow. Soon, you are in a wide, open square, and Estrid is beckoning you towards a great hall that stands ancient and resolute before you. She pushes the huge double door to the hall open without knocking or waiting. You're slightly taken aback by the sheer scale of the room you step into. Long benches flank the path to the hetman's table, and huge chandeliers hang from the rafters. A handful of trophies are placed on the walls, a reminder of the triumph of those who have ruled in Nihilusfell. The air is stale, and reeks of food, fire, and sweat. Father, I found our guest. Estrid leads you to the table that sits at the back of the hall, positioned so that those sat there can watch over everyone. The hetman looks up from his conversation at his daughter's call and quickly stands up as you approach. He greets you warmly and heartily, with arms wide and a smile to match, bowing his head in your direction. Well met, Outlander. In Swafnar and Travia's name, you are most welcome here. Thank you for joining us this morning. Please sit. Take your fill of food and drink. A wide spread of meats, fish, and breads covers the central square of the table in easy reach of the Hetman and his family. Uh, thank you, Hetman. It's a pleasure to be seated with you. Ulfgar waves a dismissive hand at you at your comet as you walk up the small set of stairs towards his table. It is only what's due, Outlander. Please, sit. Come, we must get to business. This is Bran. He's the town's goatee, and he's been an advisor to the head person for many decades now. Sir, you look very suspicious. Then again, oh man, what was the guy's name from, um, ah, uh, the guy's name from Vikings. I can't remember his name. The Seer. Yeah, he looked suspicious too, the entire time. So, meh, I guess it's just a thing. He indicates an older, near decrepit man in a heavy bundle of robes who sits and eats at the t at the end of the table. Bran gives you a long side glance that immediately unnerves you, but he says nothing and continues chewing. Without wasting another breath, the hetman moves on to introduce the other, younger man at the table. I believe you met my youngest, Raskir. 
Raskier nods at, at you curtly as he throws a bite of bread into his mouth, then picks up a tankard to drink from. Once again, he seems to look you up and down before he leans across the table to give you a strong handshake. Thank you again for escorting the Nostrian trader to our town. I'm sorry it wasn't as simple as suggested. The whole thing is rather troubling. Mm. A shame about the cart. It's worth more coin. You seem upset by this. Uh, I'll do... You seem upset by this. Forgive my saying so, but you seem more upset by this than I did expect. Rescue chuckles before taking a sip from this tanker and reaching toward, reaching forward to rip a handful of bread from the loaf. Do you know what it means to be peaceless, Outlander? Um, I don't know. To be peaceless is the worst punishment a Thor Waller could face. It is the punishment we give to those who have committed terrible, terrible crimes. They are ashamed to their ancestors, and they have been stripped of all honor they had and can ever have. They will never find peace with the gods. They will never fight at Swapnir's side or drink at Travia's table. That is why the peaceless are scorned and hide amongst themselves on the all port stones. So they're like excommunicated. For them to return in force to the mainland makes no sense. But if a group of them have, then, ah, excuse me, but if a group of them have, then they are a grave danger and we must deal with them. An uncomfortable silence falls on the hall while you process what Raskier has said. <clears throat> Out of it, it is, het it is the hetman that clears his throat to speak up, talking to you over his drink. I've called you here for your help, Outlander. You've already proven that you are a capable fighter. You could be of great help to us once again, and my son is right. We must deal with the peaceless. Today, he and Estrid will head out to find those that remain and end the threat before they can strike again. I'd like you to join them. Hmm. Just the three of us? Really? It was quite a number that attacked us, and still a fair few that fled when it was over. Wouldn't it be better to send a larger group of warriors if you hope to defeat them? A band like this would simply turn and run at the sight of an army of Thorillian warriors coming to meet them. If everything goes according to plan, a smaller group can catch them off guard. And besides, I've seen you fight. Together, we're more than good enough to defeat those wretches. With the room falling quiet again, you can't help but notice the small, niggling feeling in the back of your mind. You can't place it but it only adds to the uneasiness that's been building in your chest all throughout the morning. I'm happy to pay you, Outlander, if that's what it takes. And you're welcome to stay here as a guest for a while at least, if that suits you. Of the three of them, Ulfgar is the only one who seems patient to await your answer. Estrid is at least trying to mask her uneasiness, glancing up at you between small pickings of her food. Raskir, though, makes no effort to hide the fact that he's on edge staring over his meal something's wrong what what aren't you telling me in the same moment rescue rolls his eyes in frustration estrid sighs and rubs hers the hetman quickly signals for them both to settle down shifting in his seat and putting a careful hand on the table we aren't trying to deceive you outlander there are there are things in motion that are beyond your control outlander the stranger at the end of the table has been so quiet throughout the meal that you had forgotten he was there. Now, though, you look at him as he spits out a fishbone and glances across at, ah, across to you. And under his gaze, you feel the hair on the back of your neck stand on end. It is the will of the Runjas that you arrived here. If they had wished to keep you in Austria or anywhere in the south, they would not have brought you here. But here you are so that you may aid us in this. The headman did not wish for me to tell you. He thought you may doubt what the Rungers have revealed to us. One look back at the headman tells you that he is feeling a measure of regret at the Goldie's outburst. But again, he awaits your response. Hmm. What did they say? 
What did the run just tell you exactly? That an unknown warrior would aid us in what is to come. Before you arrived, we did not understand what that meant. But then the peaceless chased you to our doorstep. The Runges have revealed their will to us. I'm sorry that I wasn't more open with you until now. There's little more we can say now, Father. Either the Outlander will help us, or he won't. You're very conscious that all three of them now await your final answer. But as you sit in silent contemplation of, you, of his words, your eyes are drawn back across the room to the Godi. He has gone back to his own little world, chewing on some dry fish and staring off into some part of space. But you feel pressure building, left with very little time to think about your decision. Especially as the Hetman and his family have all now left their meals alone and are fully focused on you. Your mind teeters a little at the idea that your arrival in Islesville was preordained. The gods have never struck you as a particularly forthcoming with their plans, if they ever had any. But there's this niggling sensation again, chewing at the back of your mind. Are we agreed, Outlander? You sit stunned for one more moment, then you are overwhelmed and without realizing it, you nod. Just once. Uh, agreed. Hetman. I'll help where I can. Then your word is a pledge to me. There is no hint of his jovial nature now. He is grim and reserved as he nods. You should all prepare to leave as soon as possible. Good hunting. Okay. I wonder if this is going to be kind of similar to a certain... Uh, what was that? I, I can't remember the name of this party RPG that came out a while ago. Maybe someone in the comment section can help me out with that. But I remember you had to survive going across, I guess, the country or the world. And if characters died, they actually died. Like that was the end of it. Kind of similar to Fire Emblem and so on and so forth. But I think there were giants in the world and so on and so forth that you had to deal with. But you had to kind of help your your people go across the land i think it was made by some people that were formerly members of bioware if i'm not mistaken but i can't remember the name right off the top of my head i've always wanted to play that series i played a little bit of the first one but i didn't get very far after that so uh let's see blessings of the hunt you meet with the hetman's children estrid and raskier in order to prepare for the task ahead so i guess when each town we go each town that we go to I'm guessing we'll have little things that we can do, little side quests we can possibly do. So let's jump into this. Chapter Blessings of the Hunt. Preparations do not take long. You're told to bring as little as you can for you will move swiftly and sleep roughly should the need arise. You're well practiced for such exercises and soon you are armed, armored, and once again underway. You shouldn't be, nerv you shouldn't be nervous as you walk back out of the longhouse and through the town of Alisville. Nerves before this kind of skirmish were honed out of you years ago. But something about the words of the old man, the goatee, are toying with your mind. The wallers lean heavily on the wheel of their runges. Over the years, you've heard many Thorwallers traveling further south talk about them very openly. Never has it affected you so personally. Is it really their will that you be here now? If so, why? Why not someone else? These questions grate on you, no matter how hard you fight to shake them off before you reach the palisade. Estrid and Raskir are waiting for you there. They both cut far more imposing figures dressed and ready for a fight. They both acknowledge your arrival with a quiet nod as they glance over your equipment to gauge your readiness. Hmm. Let's hunt some outlaws. Raskiri quickly lets out a hearty laugh and points at you as he looks at his sister. I like this one. She gives you each a wry smile, but quickly motions for you both to calm down. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, or our confidence will kill us faster than any peaceless can. Before we begin, we will ask Swafnir for a blessing. Will you join us? Um... Uh... I don't know the prayers, honestly. I don't know anything about this world, so I don't know your prayers. I don't know your prayers well enough to take part in something like this seriously. No matter. It is simple. 
You can listen to me and Estrid first, and that will be enough. Feel no pressure, Outlander. For us, this is tradition. It goes unnoticed by her brother, but you hear the very slight pause in her explanation. It is our duty to fulfill. For you, the offer is extended only if you wish for it. Though I'm sure the gods would welcome it. Then I'll join you. Estrid bows her head to respect your decision before moving to break the circle you have all formed in the street. As she walks away from you, you catch the subtle but strange look on her face. Somewhere between disappointment and concern. Hmm. Raskir, meanwhile, doesn't hide his joy at your decision. They line up next to each other a few steps out of the way of the path out of town. You stand next to Estrid, following their lead as they lie their weapon their weapons down at their feet. Raskir first bows his head and raises his hand over his axe, with his palms facing towards the heavens. O Swafnir, brave conqueror, tireless hunter, watch over this axe and its bearer. He speaks with a ferocity you were not quite expecting, letting his voice carry far with no hint of shame. You didn't expect this dude to have a booming ferocious voice? Look at this guy. Looks like Thor. In your name and by your will, I go forth to fight. To build upon the honor of my forebears. To prepare for the final fight. To fulfill my destiny. That is my goal. Grant me but a piece of your godly power and let me prevail. With that, he snatches his axe back up, though he awaits he waits where he stands for Estrid to say her prayers too. She repeats the prayer almost word for word, changing only axe for sword and shield. Then it's your turn. You take it slowly to make sure you do not get the words wrong. Your prayer is not as strong or as confident as Estrid's, and certainly not as much as Raskier's. But he is nodding at you when you pick your sword back up to affirm you have done everything correctly. Estrid's expression is much harder to read, but she holds herself confidently as she double checks the straps of her van braces. You take the lead, Outlander. Take us where you were first attacked. We will pick up the trail from there. Manhunt. It doesn't take long for you to reach the point where you remember ducking for cover. The cart lies abandoned in the middle of the road, its rear, its right rear wheel buckled in from where you kicked it. But there are no signs of the wares that were being carried, just a handful of arrows strewn about and light, confused footprints going this way and that about the place. Uh, about the place. They must have come back for the wares after they fled. At least that will make them easy to track. The three of you spend some time pacing the area, deducing which footprints are those you need. All of you are quiet as you work, focused or perhaps conscious of falling into the same trap again. But then you find them, heavy imprints of boots in the verge of the road, heading north. As you come from the southeast, you know they aren't yours, but they are fresh, definitely less than a day is old. Uh, signal the siblings. On the off chance that you are not alone, you give a sharp whistle to get the siblings' attentions. When they are both looking towards you, you indicate the direction the tracks lead in. Their faces fall when they see you pointing north, and they look around carefully as they close towards you. It's very strange. They passed around Alicefell to get here. They must have given it a wide berth. But there's nothing out there. A good day's march will already bring you to the foot of the Haldor Mountains. Or Yaldor. Hmm. The perfect place to hide in an encampment, away from any towns and any prying eyes. Hmm. And they weren't seen? If they travel so far out in the open plains, how were they not seen? No doubt they traveled by night, though that is a long way to come from for such a small reward. But then these people are peaceless. Maybe they are driven to desperation. Come, we should get going. We are already hours behind. Astrid quickens the pace as you leave the road behind and start your way across the country. The way is easy, at least. They are not flat plains you cross at a light jog, but only gently sloping hills. 
However, you see the mountains creeping towards you from the north, and you know the way will get harder. You run at a steady pace, keeping your breathing controlled using years of training and experience. You run beside Raskir, who is heavier of foot and breath, even though he doesn't seem to struggle at all. In fact, with his great axe held tightly in one hand as he runs along, he seems very much at ease. As you run, he looks across at you and speaks with, the, with big gaps in which to breathe. You look as though you've done this before, Outlander. Are you an experienced tracker? Um, you could say that. When it becomes clear, you will say nothing more about it. He laughs and nods. Oh, that's good for us. A tracker and a fighter. This will be easy. Um, I hope so. You continue on that pace for a good few hours without event. Further and further north you go, ever closer to those snow-capped mountains. Estrid makes it her job to keep an eye on the tracks, which don't relent. The outlaws, the peaceless, you follow, you follow were not worried about being seen or covering their tracks, it seems. They were completely focused on their own goal, whatever that was, though Estrid says they were moving slower. The sun is at its peak when she stops, stops your march at the top of a hill. Each climb is getting steadily harder, and all three of you are breathing deeply to recover while you can. Estrid, though, brings your attention to a forest at the foot of the mountains that you can now see quite clearly before you. It is still quite some distance away, but there is a settlement at the forest's edge. Even so far away, you can see smoke rising from it, like a campfire to see from miles around. Hmm. Do you think that's them? It must be. The tracks still head north, and that is the only place between here and the and the Yaldor Mountains. I thought Yalvik had been abandoned decades ago. It was too far from the sea, and too difficult to sustain. They must have run through the whole night to get there already. Hmm. We should be careful. Or, we should approach carefully. If they are keeping watch, they might spot us on the hillsides. We've made good time, though it's already midday. I think we can slow down. Not too much, though. Something's going on here, and I don't like it. Come on, and conserve your energy while you can. It's a grave silence that falls on you as you start forward again. It's different from before. You feel attention again, and not just your own, but theirs as well. Time seems to slow down as you prepare yourself for whatever encounter is to come. Already, you feel all your muscles tense and tighten, and you feel your senses just that little bit more on edge. It's as if your body knows more than you do that a difficult fight lies ahead of you. It must be mid-afternoon by the time you eventually arrive. As the earth starts to slope more steadily upwards underneath you, Estrid orders you to slow down again. Soon you are crawling through long grass slowly and on your bellies as to not draw any unwanted attention. After what seems like an eternity like this, through the blades and reeds around you, you see Yalvik. At least you see parts of it. Where the long grass stops, a small dirt road cuts across you from west to east, leading off towards the mountains. Beyond that, you see the remains of a very small village built across the uneven land of the mountain's roots. A palisade blocks your view of most of the village, but you see some of the ruined rooftops. If it weren't for the two guards standing at the gateway, you'd say no one had lived here for a very long time. They're expecting trouble. Why else would they keep watch? It's two guards. We can take them. Hmm. It's not just two. It's not just two, though. If we take them on, it'll alert the village, and then they might be on us in moments. The Outland is right, Raskier. We can't just go charging in. We need to be smart about this. Bah! Hmm. Um, we can come back, or we need to think quickly. We need, we need to think quickly. Yeah, we need to think of something quickly, any which way. Trying not to move the brush around you too much, you look across to Estrid, who is biting her lip in thought. 
Hold on, look, coming down the road. Brain your neck so that you can see whatever it is that Rasgir has seen. From the west, another outlaw shoves a man down the path towards the abandoned village. The man is desperately trying to wrestle out of the thick and tight rope bonds around his hands. Immediately after them, another pair follows, another outlaw and another prisoner. This one is more subdued. Hmm. They have prisoners. That settles it. I'm going. Follow me or don't. Before he moves so much as an inch, Estrid lunges through the grass and snatches his arm tightly. Don't move. We can't let those people suffer, Estrid. There's no decision to be... They have two prisoners, which means they can kill one of them just to make a point. We have to be careful. Uh, any ideas, Estrid? What do you think we should do? She takes another brief moment to collect her thoughts before she nods. We should double back and approach from the forest and try to sneak through the palisades from there. If we can do that, we can deal with any peaceless we come across quickly and quietly without raising an alarm. Then we can rescue the prisoners. We might even find a way to get them to safety before the fighting begins in earnest. You hear Raskir let out a disgusted snort. And what if they kill the prisoners before we make it all the way around the forest? What if we're delayed or caught? Those people cannot be allowed to die. What would you do then? There's only silence for a moment while the young Thorwillian warrior actually thinks. But then you hear a growling sigh. If we cannot storm the gates, then we shall ask for an invitation into the village. What? They won't attack us on sight. If we approach from the road, they won't attack us on sight. We can use that to get close, attack the guards before they can call for help, and storm the village without losing time. Beside you, Estrid shakes her head and then taps it gently against the floor in frustration. You cannot be that much of a fool, brother. We are outnumbered. That kind of attack will get us all killed. The prisoners have already long been dragged out of view, and there are no more hints as to the peacelessness true numbers. You simply do not have enough time to give either plan proper thought. Whichever plan you choose, there will be limited time to execute it. Um, You know, Rescuer's plan is actually not terrible. And I would assume that in the chaos, maybe they wouldn't have enough of a chance to actually kill the prisoners. However, I'm going to go with Estrich's plan because why would they turn around and drag these people up here just to kill them? So, yeah, that might give us a, a chance to kind of thin those numbers, then surprise them. A direct attack is too risky. We should go with Estrid's plan. Thank you, Outlander. You see her glance across to her brother with a tilt of her head that you recognize as a so there. Fine. Let us hope that the gods understand your reasoning if this goes wrong, Estrid. More than anything else, Raskir sounds disappointed, but Estrid has already moved on, snaking slowly backwards. Come on, both of you. There's no time to lose. It takes some time to back out of view of the guards and then double around into the forest west of Yalvik. The telltale signs of autumn turning to winter are far clearer under the thick cover of the trees. A little snow has already come down from the mountains, and the air is cool and crisp. Your breath billows out in front of you as you run down the long, unused paths to make up for lost time. Estrid is focused on the task at hand, and Raskir seems more and more agitated the longer the journey takes. Eventually, though, you come to the palisade again, this time on the northwestern side of the village. Estrid orders you to stop in the shadows of the stronger, taller trees, those that weren't cut away to make way for the palisade. You can see a gap in the tall fencing that the three of you could easily fit through. You just need to make sure it's safe. Estrid sneaks forward alone first, creeping over to peer through the gap in the palisade. After a few moments, she signals for you and Raskir to approach. You do your best not to disturb the stillness as you make your way through the brush. At the palisade, you try to gauge what might be on the other side, but the angle is too oblique. You hear some voices, though, and Estrid raises a finger to her lips as she watches something you cannot see. When the voices die down, she nods and speaks in a breathless whisper. 
It doesn't look like they're on guard or patrol, at least not here. I can't see the prisoners though. We will sneak through and then split up and make our way, our ways through the village. If we don't find them before we get to the square, that's where we'll surprise the peaceless. Hmm, what about the outlaws? What do we do with the outlaws we run into along the way? You noisily mouth your question, leaving it to hope that she can read your lips. In response, she scowls at you and shrugs. Deal with them, quietly. You nod to show you understand and immediately turn your attention to the task at hand. You take another careful look and listen to make sure you don't run straight into the path of any peaceless. And then you push through the gap, shoulder first, noiselessly squeezing between the wooden uprights. Even before you are through, you start to take in your new surroundings as you sneak into Yalvik. You take a moment to take stock of everything you can see and everything you can hear. Everywhere you look, there are old dilapidated wooden houses and gardens overrun with wild flowers. Broken cobbled stone paths lead away deeper into the village and the air stinks of rotting wood. Where it was quiet before, now you hear voices on the gentle wind though you cannot see their source. And all of a sudden, the tension feels so much more than it did before. As quickly and quietly and carefully as you can, you draw your sword and hold it as, uh, hold it at the ready. Behind you, Estrid and Rascue are creeping to the village too, staying quiet as if they look, as, they, as if they look carefully around. They quickly disappear around corners you can't follow, and your attention turns to the matter at hand. You must get to the village square unseen. Gather round, gather round, I shall now speak. You aren't sure exactly where the voice is coming from, except the direction of the square, but it makes you freeze. We've been busy of, as of late, and there have been many sacrifices, but good work has been done, and so shall it continue today. A roar of cheers rises up in response, which only serves as to make you even more nervous. Much closer to you, you hear the sound of a door opening and realize someone is leaving the hut you stand beside. Before you can be seen, you dash to the wall of the building, where crates and boxes lie long abandoned and empty. You skirt behind them as quietly as you can as an outlaw rounds the corner, walking down the path towards you. With bated breath, you wait and wonder for a moment whether you hastily, whether your hastily chosen hiding spot will be seen. But the outlaw passes and you swallow your nerves down as you focus, as your focus gathers. It's only a matter of time before the other, the other person rounds the same corner and you need to be on your way. Mm. I'm gonna go ahead and use battle sense just to kind of give me a delay of the land, I guess you can say. And I'm pretty sure the game actually wants me to do it since it's actually highlighting it. <clears throat> With a deep breath, you ignore the ongoing speech and all the raucous cheers. Instead, you listen for any sound, any movement nearby that might tell you where the nearest outlaw is. It's the clink of their axe against their belt that you hear first, around the corner to your left. You have a window to sneak away unnoticed, if you wish to use it. Mm. I mean, I'm going to have to fight these guys eventually anyway. So let's go ahead and take him out now so that way we don't have to deal with him later. We decide instead to use the information to take the outlaw by surprise. As he walks around the corner, you dash toward him and cover his mouth with your hand to stop him from yelling out. You struggle to turn around so that you can slip your sword arm around his neck and quietly choke him out. He fights back, hitting you in the gut with his elbow until the stranglehold works and he falls unconscious. There, you silently lie him down and dash to the next street, which leads you down a path of broken stone stairs. There, you find an alcove you can hide in to take stock. In the square, the peace list seems to be gathered around this mysterious speaker. To your horror, you see one of the prisoners being dragged up next to the speaker by an outlaw with a dagger. Your people abandon you. They call you peaceless. They say you will never have honor before the gods. Well, I ask you, my friends, what will their honor be worth when all their gods are dead? There's another chorus of cheers from the crowd, 
and you see the prisoner sob and bow his head. You need to get closer, but between you and what looks like more and more like a sacrifice is another outlaw. She stands by the wall of a house across the stepped path, watching the ceremony with folded arms. There simply isn't time to sneak around her. You will need to fight through her to continue on your way. Mm. Mm, forceful blow, take the outlaw out. Yeah, because I don't want to use too much of this stuff right now. So, yeah, let me just take the outlaw out. With the speaker's eyes locked on this passionate crowd, you, free, you are free to dash out of the shadows towards the outlaw. She must hear you or see you from the corner of her eye as she turns towards you before you can reach her. Before she has time to cry out, you run into her, pushing her into the wall in an attempt to surprise her. She manages to get an axe between her body and your sword before you can silence her for good. With your sword caught, she twists her axe around and tries to use it to push away from her. The two of you are stuck there for a moment as you each try to overpower the other. In the square, you hear another loud cry, and you feel time pressing on as you continue your struggle. You gauge that you can still make it in time if you strike quickly at the outlaw, but that will give her opportunity to strike as well. Mm. Yeah, let's strike quickly. With a growl, you disengage from the struggle and step back and prepare yourself for a final decisive strike. She doesn't hesitate, sweeping her axe viciously across your arm to dissuade you from trying again, but it doesn't work, and a moment later your sword cuts cleanly through her neck to end the fight. Before she makes a sound, you cover her mouth with a gloved hand, lowering her body to the floor as gracefully as you can, and once more you move along the street until you reach another makeshift path looking down into the square. This time you see Estrid and Rascue looking across at you from the shadows of the next house over. Are you alright, Outlander? She nods towards the cut on your arm. Um, I'm fine. You quickly turn your attention to the square further down the hill to your left. What's going on? Whatever it is, it's not good. If we're going to do something, then it has to be now. In the square, a prisoner is now being wrestled onto his knees by the outlaw, held there by the dagger at his throat. The speaker still shouts passionately to the crowd, riling them up into a frenzied enthusiasm. You are not abandoned, but found. And today, that will be rewarded. Time to end this. Let's go ahead and use that forceful blow now. Without hesitation, you dash out of the shadows and race toward, race forwards with a cry. You won't be stopped, sidestepping someone at the back of the crowd to crash through them all noisily. What? The speaker only has time to dive away from you as you leap up to slice through the prisoner's guard with a devastating blow. To honor, to glory, Rascue cries out behind you as the siblings leap forward and into the fray. There is a small army now forming ahead of you, and the battle has only just begun. You're very quickly surrounded. Even with all your training and experience, there's no way you can take them all on alone. You fight your way through to Estrid and Rascue, dealing only with the problems that lie between you. A block here, a parry there. The first outlaw to truly block your path is quickly felled with a savage swipe at his legs, sending him barreling to the floor. Straight away, you find yourself face to face with another, wielding an axe in each hand. Mm. Should I dive away or should I use that forceful blow? <laughs> uh. Only got 17 health. Let's see. Let's engage. You twist your sword into a defensive stance that you use to block the first of the warrior's heavy blows. Lighter on your feet, you can move much quicker, and as he recovers, you strike him in the chest. You have enough time to watch him sink to the floor before the next warrior is upon you. She uses a shield to strike you hard in the chest, winding you, winding you as you hit the floor hard. With that, she raises a shield high above her head and prepares to strike the killing blow. Uh, I feel like if I counter, I'm gonna get hit. Mm, but let's try it. 
As it pummels towards you, you catch the strike and throw it away, hitting the warrior with the pommel of your sword. She staggers backwards, which gives you enough room to push yourself up before she strikes at you again. You parry that too, knocking her sword from her hand to leave her defenseless against your next strike. That's when you catch your breath. A number of the peaceless already lie dead, but many more are swarming over Estrid and Raskir. And then they're on top of you as well, and you're forced to block and counter another swinging axe. Between strikes it's difficult to gauge how much longer you'll need if you can last at all last at all as you cast your eyes over the battlefield you catch sight of yet another warrior coming towards you big and burly is this fighter he's another to wield a vicious weapon in both hands with a snarl and an angry cry he starts to sprint towards you already preparing to strike with a terrible blow um i feel like the counter might not work too well because he has a gigantic axe Parrying also probably wouldn't work too well because it's a gigantic axe. So let me sidestep and see if I can hit him. As he brings the axe forward again with a howl, you duck and step out of his way, causing him to overreach. As he tumbles over, you strike him in the back of the legs with your sword. He cries out, but quickly gets back to his feet, readjusting his grip on the axe as he limps around to face you. As your eyes meet, you spin your sword back around to be ready once again. Um, yeah, let me do a flurry of blows, of blows, cause I mean, he should be slower than me. You launch into a flurry of quick and precise blows that aim to throw the warrior off guard. That works and he's forced to catch the strikes awkwardly with his ax, allowing you to press him back unrelentingly. His limp makes it easy for you to wrong foot him, keeping your attack short and sharp and on his weak side. As he tries to force you away with a punch of the axe handle, you duck underneath him and strike upwards. Your slice catches him in, the, in his stronger arm and he cries out in pain. Pain quickly turns to anger and he lashes out, trying to find a way back into the fight. Back and forth you go, trying to find an opening against this relentless foe, but you are starting to gain a palpable edge as the injuries you've already inflicted start to catch up with him. He must sense this too, as he turns to the others as he turns to other means to regain his advantage when you drive him back once again. He grabs an outlaw who is busy fighting Raskier and hurls her towards you to catch you off guard. She tumbles towards you quickly and you have to dart out of her way so that she doesn't crash into you. Your opponent has brought himself some time, but you still hold a significant advantage. With a desperate swing of his ax that you can easily block, you finally get, he finally gives you an opening to make the final blow. Um, again with the quick strike. With his axe locked behind you by your sword, you use one arm to elbow him sharply in the ribs. As he doubles over, you use the pommel of your sword to hit him in the head, sending him falling to the floor. There, you twist your sword around to drive it decisively through his back. With one last groan, he finally falls silent and you are able to catch your breath. You're not entirely sure how you're still alive, but you know that you are. You have a brief moment to look around as the nearest outlaws look at you cautiously before re-engaging. Nearby, the hitman's children are still fighting away. Rescuer howls and cries as he swings his ax across an outlaw's chest and they collapse in front of him. Without hesitation, he leaps forward to the next and the next after that, cutting through them like they're nothing. Not much further away, you see Estrid's trap, Estrid trap a warrior's sword arm between her sword and shield. In a flash, she uses both to twist the man's arm around awkwardly, forcing the sword from it. It's a neat and fluid disarm that you'll have to ask her about when you have fewer pressing matters at hand. The three of you are being boxed in together not far from where the speaker originally preached. The number advantage is beginning to dwindle now, with many of the peaceless lying either dead or too injured to fight. But they still hold a number, a numbers advantage. You have to work together to stop yourselves from being surrounded. Hmm. I don't know if I want to leap into the fray, because again, I don't have that much health. Um, if I fight methodically, that might take too much time and that might cause the prisoners to get killed. Uh, let me cause a distraction. 
Riding the adrenaline, you call out towards the group that stands between you and the siblings. Those at the rear turn to face you immediately, preparing themselves for re-engagement. Um, and I will use a forceful blow. Without hesitation, you put all your strength into a quick sweeping blow of your sword. The first warrior has no time to defend themselves, while the other's worn axe isn't strong enough to hold. Both fall to the ground with agonizing screams. That gets the attention of the rest of the group and gives Estrid and Raskier the opportunity to strike from behind. Have you seen the prisoners, Outlander? Estrid shouts at you while, the, while she fends off one of the remaining pieces with her shield. No, there's nothing we can do now, Estrid, except keep fighting. One of the warriors tries to wrestle Raskier's axe from his grasp, but with a growl, he headbutts them away again. We're almost through. You're about to scold him for daring to say something so stupid when, out of nowhere, you feel your heart sink. It only lasts the briefest of moments, but it's so intense and so crushing that you are left stunned by its arrival. All three of you freeze and find yourself breathing hard as the fighting comes to a sudden stop. And as you swallow uncomfortably, you hear your eyes are drawn to the speaker who stands on the other side of the square. He holds up a trinket that fits into his outstretched hand, which he has thrust towards you like a weapon. On it, you see lines etched into metal like some archaic and mysterious symbol. It is one and the same as the symbol painted on every shield you can see, and some freshly inked tattoos as well. As your eyes lock with it, you are filled with a strange and nervous tension that fills you with discomfort. Your first instinct is to run, to keep out of out of view, to do anything that will shake that discomfort from you. The speaker must see it on your face, in one of your faces. He chuckles and starts to step behind the crowd of priests of peaceless that now regroup between you. You shall not know peace. Kill them. With a cry, the peaceless has come at you again, and you have to move quickly to stop them from killing you on the spot. If we can stop the sorcerer, then we can put an end to this. Very well, with me. Rasker gives a furious cry and swings his axe in both hands, almost full circle around himself. The remaining peaceless dive backwards out of Rasker's way, staying between you and your new target. But if there is magic at work here, then you know you must strike before it clouds your mind once more. You have to get past these warriors somehow before the sorcerer can distract you again. Uh, oh crap, if I use battle sense, then I don't have enough to actually do a forceful blow or anything, but I kind of need it. You leave the fighting itself to instinct and instead push all your focus into your senses. Dealing with the peaceless becomes much easier with all the advantages you find from where no one else looks. One who stands on a loose stone is thrown off balance when you aim a powerful kick at the step. You and Estrid work together to push another couple through a weak spot you notice in the nearby wall. As his defensive line fails, the sorcerer's face falls and becomes a mix of worry and anger. But now you're face to face and able to put an end to the mastermind's scheme. Uh, really wish I had that forceful blow of crap. Tread carefully. Your first instinct is to strike him down where he stands, but the power he displayed still plays on your mind. He does not look much of a threat, but you don't know what he's capable of, and you feel the need to tread carefully. So you raise your sword into a defensive stance and walk slowly towards him. But he sees this and grins and thrusts the amulet towards you once again. No peace. Again, your eyes lock with the pendant and you fall to your knees as your heart drops suddenly. You're overwhelmed, brought low by the most uncomfortable feeling that something is just not quite right. And so you barely pay attention to Raskier leaping past you to attack the sorcerer as regret takes you. Why do you feel regret? Guilt even. Then, just like that, your mind is clear again. You shake it as you try to remember what is going on. Outlander. Estrid, we have to strike together. That power, is, it's too strong. She pulls you back to your feet as the sorcerer pulls a sword from his belt to slash Raskier across the face. 
Together it is then. Now, uh, let's do a flurry of blows. Let's end this quickly. You try to catch the sorcerer off guard by twisting your sword this way and that with blow after blow. He's soon straining to catch each of your strikes, press backwards as you outclass him in sword play. Crucially, Estrid makes use of, this, of the distraction, moving around you to trip him up with her shield. He's quick to scurry away, trying to stand so that he doesn't trip over the stairs, but he doesn't have enough time to stop, your press, stop you pressing your attack. Mm. I am going to defer to Estrid. So that you don't tire as quickly, you back off and Estrid immediately jumps forward to lead the attack. Sensing an opportunity, the sorcerer tries to jump back to his feet, only to be struck in the face by Estrid's shield. To finally put an end to it, you dart around the fight to cut off any means of escape the sorcerer might hope to find. He makes a noise resembling a hiss as he backs away from Estrid, only to find himself pressing into your legs. As Raskier finally rejo rejoins you, covered in blood but still furious, the sorcerer looks around at all of you and he grins and laughs. It's not the first time you've experienced such a reaction, and you even find yourself rolling your eyes. He cackles as he stretches a hand out towards you. By the time you think about raising your sword to stop him, it's already too late. He's spoken an incantation of some kind, and is back to howling with laughter. And once again, you feel that strange aching pain in your chest, and it pulls your focus away from the task at hand. What are you even doing here? Who are these strangers in this strange land? Did the siblings know that this might happen? Why did they not warn you? Can they be trusted? How are these simple outlaws able to push you so far for so long? What does that say about you? It just all makes you feel so contrite. Some part of your mind recognizes that you must break free of whatever spell this sorcerer has put you under. You shake your head as you try to find something, anything to cling to, to return to reality. Mm, I am going to trust in, I mean, I don't know them for real. <laughs> so I'm gonna trust in my experience. You must have seen magic like this before. You know you must have. You've decades of experience to fall back on. You've been working as a mercenary for such a long time, and before that as a soldier. In fact, you barely remember a time when you weren't fighting something or someone. It really has been such a long time. Might things have been better if you hadn't been so hasty? You're so lost in your train of thought that you barely register your knees hitting the ground. It's almost as though you're watching a play as you see Raskir shake his head and look at Estrid and then you. A part of your mind still fights with all its strength to be free of the spell, but your body simply won't comply. The sorcerer says something, but his words are muffled and drowned in some invisible dream-like lake. That is, until Raskar drives his axe through the man's head and you're released from the spell. With a long, inwards breath, you collapse forwards onto your hands, gasping for air. Once and then twice, you shake your head, still breathing heavily as you push yourself back up. With that, quiet once again falls on the small abandoned village of Yalvik. The strain of it all hits you immediately and you take long deep breaths as your head spins. The battle is finally over. The Battle of Yalvik, so I got that achievement. I wonder if I could have died there. I'm pretty sure I could have died there. I would have made some mistakes. You're not afraid to admit that you were relieved. You set your sword down for a few moments, looking up at the sky as you take stock of events. It was a much harder fight than you were expecting. You can already feel the injury starting to creep up on you. You're getting too old for things like this. Are you all right? I'm fine, Estrid. It's just another scratch. It's not a scratch. Here, let me... I said I'm fine. You're brought back to reality by their bickering and look up to see them both looking angry and upset. Raskier quickly stretches his arm out towards you and laughs as he sees you looking at them. Thank you for your help today, Outlander. This was much easier with your help. 
He must see something in your expression as he quickly changes back to a scowl. Are you all right? The sorcerer got to me. He got in my head, that's all. Yes, he was very powerful. Whatever power it was, it was nothing good. As Estrid paces around, she finds herself standing in front of one of the pieces fallen shields. She uses a foot to kick it over, and then takes a long, hard look at the symbol painted on its front. I don't know this writing. At first I thought it might be a symbol, but if it is, then it's not of any of our gods. Something fouler was at work here. He never mentioned any names. All of you turned towards the voice, once again on guard at the first sign of a new threat. You immediately recognize one of the prisoners creeping through the door of a nearby ruined house. At the sight of the sibling's weapon, she immediately puts up her hands, though they are bound together by thick ropes. The second prisoner appears behind her a moment later, looking around nervously. The first indicates the sorcerer's body with a nervous, pointing finger. Before you arrived, he never said who or what they follow, and neither did any of the soldiers who captured us. He just kept complaining about the way the peaceless are treated. Never mind that. Estrid hurries over to her to untie the bounds around her hands. Are you both all right? Fine, I think. A few scrapes and bruises, but we'll recover, I think. When she's free, she nervously looks around at you while Raskir unties the other prisoner. I'm sorry to you both for the whole ordeal. They both nod, but both still seem shaken and afraid as they rub their wrists. Hmm... Where are you from? Varnheim. We were traveling south to trade when they attacked us on the road. It wasn't even at night. Middle of the day. Quiet. Quite in the open. They just ran at us from all sides. We didn't even have the chance to defend ourselves. They knocked us out. And when we came about, we were in that forest. When was this? Two days past, I think. I understand. That's enough for now. You can return to Alicefell with us. From there, we'll make sure you return home safely. Slowly, they both nod their understanding. Estrid shepherds them towards the village gateway and tells them to warn her if there is any sign of trouble. When she returns, she glances again at the shield she kicked over and then takes another long glance about the place. We can't just leave it like this. Hmm... Um, it needs to be destroyed. All of this needs to be destroyed. The bodies burn, the shields, the pendant, wherever that's going. I agree. Whatever has happened here, it is clearly evil. It cannot be allowed to remain. Estrid seems perplexed for a moment, but then she nods. Fine, but I would like to make note of this symbol before they are all destroyed. Perhaps Bran might recognize it. And what of the pieces here who are injured, not dead? What should we do with them? Estrid takes a long look around at those pieces who lie unconscious or groaning as they nurse serious wounds. Raskir stalks one that is trying to crawl away down the stairs and then puts his boot on the man's back to stop him. Their lives were forfeit even before they aligned themselves to whatever darkness this is. We must execute them. Hmm. I mean, they might have information, though, but at the same time, I don't like the fact that they have these symbols on them that could be used for some dark purpose that might turn around and hurt us. But I will say they could be useful. They might be useful to keep alive. Ask your scowls at you as you pick your sword up and wipe it down on your trouser leg. What? The outland is right, Raskier. Raskir rounds on his sister angrily, but she pushes him away and signals for him to calm down. All of this is strange. The pieces gathering on the mainland like this, the symbol, the sorcerer, the ceremony. It's all wrong, but we should try to understand it in case we need to know for the future. What do we possibly need to know that we don't already? They were exiled and have returned, and they've accepted the path of this sorcerer who speaks against the gods. Father would banish us both if we dragged them through his hall when we had the chance to end them here. 
And what if this is leading to something else? Would you simply have us fight it blindly? A prisoner can tell us if there are in, or if, eh, if there are other places like this, other people doing things like this. Astrid is right. Grass gear. We should take at least one prisoner, just in case. If all of this is so strange, you must take some precautions. It is the right thing to do. Ast Estrid smiles a very small, very relieved smile before she turns back to her brother to see if he understands. Father will understand, Raskir. If we don't try, we may not see something even more dangerous coming. Raskir fumes at you both for a long moment before he snarls and waves a despairing hand in your direction. On your heads be it. I will have no part in this. Estrid collects the rope she untied from the Peaceless's own prisoners. She uses it to bind one of the surviving warrior's hands and gag him. Then she looks back to the two of you with further instructions. Let's get this done. We will already be arriving back in Islesville after nightfall. The work brings you easily into the late afternoon. Raskier takes no issue in ending the suffering of those peaceless who survived the battle. Those who try to flee are met with even ang an even angrier end. And then you are faced with a pile of corpses that Estrid bitterly sets aflame. It's been some time since you last smelt that very singular smell, and your lip curls as you inhale the smoke. When the fire is blazing, everything, anything bearing the same strange line as the sorcerer bore is tossed into the flames as well. It makes the smoke even more acrid, and the three of you take no pleasure in staying much longer. You find some remnants of the supplies that you were supposed to bring to Islesville, but they're dwindling and very little remains to be salvaged. Finally, you find a pendant that the sorcerer thrust at you during the fight. Once again, as you gaze at it, you feel a discomfort that is difficult to shake. And yet somehow, you cannot simply look away. The lines and shape have a strange magnetism about them. It's only interrupted when you sense Estrid and Rescue walking over to you from the bonfire. Was he converting them? With everything we heard that sorcerer say, do you think he was converting them? He did something to convince them all to be here, to kidnap people and to do all of this. It must have been some promise he sold them. Thorwallers don't give up the gods easily, not even peaceless. Are you sure that we should not take this back to Islesville for Bran to examine properly? Absolutely not. Before you can stop him, Raskira rips the, mat, uh, the medallion from your hand and tosses it into the raging fire. A flame kicks out to swallow up the medallion, and then it is gone out of sight, never to trouble anyone again. Estrid continues to look at the fire at Raskir as Raskir starts to make his way down the steps towards the gate. She's quiet and contemplative, slowly turning to look at you and speaking under her breath. We should be glad we stopped whatever it was they were trying to achieve today, Outlander. Come on, the hitmen will be expecting us. Okay, so I think I'm going to go ahead and stop it right there. And I think I'll play some more of this. This is actually really interesting. I'm kind of curious about this story. Again, there's that Witcher slash Vikings feeling and so on and so forth. But yeah, I'm kind of curious on where this goes. It also kind of gives me a... Baldur's Gate kind of feel to it as well. And the combat is really interesting too. So yeah, I think I will play some more of this. So if you like the video, like the video. If you want to see more content like this, subscribe. I have a lot of things on the channel and I will have many other things in the future. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section and I will get to it as quickly as possible. And as far as the suggestions go, I will at least take a look at it at the very least, depending on what the game is and if I feel like it fits the content of this channel. So if you want to check out more of this game, I will have the link in the description so you can check it out. It should be out today. Um, I had an early copy of it. So again, I would like to thank the developers for that. But again, check it out, pick it up. It will be on Steam. I don't know if it'll be on other platforms, but again, I'll leave the link in the comment section. So Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. See ya.